Hello and welcome back to GI Live London for day two of our event. Our opening session today is with an industry legend, someone who has worked on massive games and franchises including Splinter Cell and Star Wars, helped launch Assassin's Creed and Watch Dogs and has worked, on some of the, worked for some of the biggest games companies in the world including Ubisoft, EA and Google. Now she's moved from those big companies to go independent setting up a new AAA studio in Montreal that's already received the backing of PlayStation. So I'm delighted to welcome Jade Raymond, the co-founder of Haven Studios. Hi, Jade. How are you? Good. Thank you so much for having me. And wow, what an intro. I'm flattered. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, was, it, was, it was, I had to work out what to keep in. That was the, uh, that was the, uh, there's, to, there's so much, or leave, leave out really, sorry, that's what I should have said. Um, there's just so much that you've, um, you've done in 25 years, I think. Is, is it, is it, you say you've been in the industry 25 years? Yeah, it's about 25 years. Yeah. Wow. 23 if you don't include internships, but you know, those were internships in the game industry. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm the same. I, I, I started off in QA and I say that I've been in the industry 14 years, but actually 16 if you include, you know, those formative years. Well, I mean, we're here to talk about your new team. So, I mean, I, there's actually very little out there about it because it was only announced earlier in the year and it was, uh, so tell us about Haven, you know, what is this studio all about? Yeah, actually, I was just thinking about it yesterday, and this is the first, you're the first person I'm talking to about this. We haven't spoken to anyone about this no. new team. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited to talk about it. I mean, first of all, Haven, the name is really important to us. Um, it has a lot of meaning to the team. Uh, we really want to create a different kind of game studio. And I think when you look up the meaning of, you know, or definition of haven in the dictionary, you're going to see, you know, uh, a safe, a place of refuge, um, you know, a place with favorable conditions for artists, etc. Um, and I really think it, the the definition, really um, is really what we're trying to achieve. Uh, you know, sums up what we're trying to achieve in our vision for the game, uh, the game studio, the games that we want to make, and. Um, and yeah, so that was the start of it is having that kind of vision with the co-founders. But I think, as you probably know, we started off, um, I guess we started thinking about this when we were still at Google uh, working on Stadia. Um, and, you know, it started to become obvious that we weren't going to be able to continue and that Stadia wasn't going to continue to invest in uh, game content. Um, and so luckily they were very supportive of me looking into a spin out and, um, you know, I had their okay to put together a high level pitch and I took that to a couple of funders and I just feel really, really, um, lucky that our first pick of people to work with, which is Sony PlayStation, um, wanted to jump in and supported us. And I really have to thank Connie and Herman, no, Connie Booth and Herman Hulst for, taking the leap and, you know, giving our team the opportunity to really start this up with the vision we have for Haven. So was it, was it just what happened at Google or what they decided to do, um, the reason why you wanted to go independent or was there other reasons why uh, you wanted to do this? Well, I think, you know, there are really two reasons. There's the team side of things and also my personal reasons. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my most, my biggest motivation was really we had this great team of talent assembled all ready to start up sg &E. And I wanted to keep that momentum and, you know, really create a haven for that team to continue great work and, um, and support the creative, the great, you know, creative synergy that we have as a team. Um, but then there's also the personal side of things. I've thought about doing a startup at many different points in my career. I've started, thought about going independent um, and really, you know, being in quarantine during the pandemic, having the opportunity to spend more time with my family because I wasn't traveling all over the place to different studios all the time. Uh, just gave me the time to take a step back. And I think as a lot of people have recently um, and just think about what's important to me and the times I was happiest in my career. And, you know, the times that I've really had the most fun is when I've been more hands-on with the team, you know, there every day, uh, working, you know, on, on new IP. And so, you know, to get a chance to do that independently is just sort of a dream, and it's really what makes me happy, you know, much more so than the, uh, you know, more removed role of an, a game executive. So um, that was also my personal motivation for it I, I well I get that very much I hear that story a lot but it's same for me I, I sort of become a, a senior manager at my uh, at my company and I, I I sort of wish I didn't 
Um, I wish I was still very much uh, uh, editing and I still and in fact the reason why I'm doing things like this I'm able to pull myself back but I hear these stories all the time of sort of you sort of get to a point where like actually I was happier two jobs ago uh, when I was uh, actually hands-on and things so that's um yeah, and I think, you know, the, I've read articles recently about, you know, they're calling it the great resignation. And I think, you know, what I, my thought process, a lot of people have been going through. And so, you know, yes, we got to spin out with this amazing team from Google, but we've also, you know, recruited like a ton of amazing senior talent because I think everyone, you know, Raphael Ecost, who came to join us, who's been art director on the AC game since we started the first one for the last 16 years, you know, came, he wants to be more hands-on in concept art. And I think a lot of people are, as you said, you know, yourself, but a lot of people are going through that kind of reflection of like mm -hmm. what really makes me happy day to day, not mm -hmm. the RPG of life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. You can, you can, you can stop leveling up at some point, but it's, um, well, at least in that way. But the the I'd about to say you started a studio from scratch, but you haven't really. You've sort of you've got a base already and you've built upon it. But it, it must be quite sort of when you try when you when you when you sort of built a studio or when you started working on the studio. Did you did you did you did you because it's independent now? You're not part of a big company. What values and objectives did you uh, set yourself when it came to so when it came to this uh, building this team? Yeah, I mean, so I talked about the name being important, Haven, yeah. and the values to support that name are equally important, right? You can't just have a vision and then it's 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 more important to walk the walk and, and um, also it's very hard to change a culture once it's established, right? If a culture has been there, you know, redirecting it, changing it is very, very hard. So we... Uh, we wanted as a founding team to spend the time thinking about, you know, what's our purpose, what's our goal, what's important to us, what are our values. Um, and luckily, as you said, we weren't completely starting to, from scratch. These are, you know, we started with 24 people who were together at Google, but also, you know, many of whom have worked with me for, you know, over 15 years since the first Assassin's Creed on Watch Dogs at, you know, three different studios and uh, on Star Wars and all these games. So, We've had many years to discuss, you know, what we think of things, and we were able to work collaboratively, co collaboratively on um, our vision for um, the values and spend quite a bit of time on that. And um, yeah, that's 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 been great, and I think it's paying off because it's helped us also focus on our recruiting and have it there from the start as you know as we build, continue to build the team and add more people. So far, it's a lot of people we've worked with before, yeah. but, you know, just making sure that those values are being implemented as we talk to people about joining and it's really clear what we're looking to do and put in place and make sure that they also share those same values and aspirations. And we're all excited about um, the same vision to make this different kind of game studio. Well, yeah, you talked about the, the Haven element of it, but what, what would you say are the, the key elements of the, that? that sort of being that haven what would you say are the are the values i guess yeah so one of the values and the one probably that's i haven't seen in a lot of other game studios is kindness mm -hmm. um we really believe that kindness is going to unlock the creative you know the creative freedom or or innovation um and that's something that really did come from the team. I wasn't there when the brainstorm happened and did this whole mind map thing and kindness appeared as the biggest word and was just being echoed by everyone. And um, I also, you know, when I think about what everyone has gone through and how, how we're all going through a lot of adjustments and have been for the last couple of years and I think about it, I, I was like, you know what, that's a great value to put forward, not only to unlock creativity and for a game studio in, in general, but just for the times in which we live. I think we all need a little bit more kindness mm -hmm. in the approach and remember how to be, you know, remember being, to be kind uh, to each other. And, and, um, and so that's one example. We have four key values. That's one of the four. Um, but I think that one really, you know, does stand out to me anyways, personally, as something that's unique and, and tied into the Haven concept. A lot of um, values, because uh, obviously a lot of studios have started up lately, a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of examples of, of, of former AAA veterans setting up their own teams. And, um, and a lot of attention has been put on the sort of trying to do their bit to make game a bit more inclusive, a little bit more diverse, um, which is exciting. But obviously it's really hard because 
I, I, there aren't that many. <laughs> there isn't that, that, that talent isn't necessarily there yet. We sort of need to work on the education side. But uh, is that something that's important to you? Is that is that is that an area you're approaching? Yeah, we want to actually be known for having a diverse team, and uh, we really all believe. Um, that the way that we're going to get to an original concept, an original IP that really resonates with a wide number of people is by having a diverse team and by bringing in those diverse perspectives, right? And not making yeah. the same old game or the same old decisions. Um, of course, you know, like many game startups, we started out with, you know, we're 53 people now and we started out with, you know, all of those people are people who have worked together at least shipping two games. And so I think this is, it's great because it gives you the ability to progress quickly and the ability to, you know, make sure mm. the team synergy is there. But, you know, often when you're building a team with the people you know and you've worked with in the past since the game industry hasn't been very diverse, yeah. you know, it's hard to, to go and be diverse. And so we actually um, strategically made the decision to hire a recruiter who's focused on diversity and inclusion. Um, her name is Medina, uh, and she has a background not only as a you know um, in talent acquisition, but also in in putting up diversity programs. And so she's designed a, a brand new recruiting framework and process for us that's really made to be inclusive from the start. And so the way we think about recruiting is we haven't had trouble. You know, luckily we've been knock on one. It's been going really well with all of the you know people interested in joining. So it's not really to go out and inc we don't have recruiters to go out and get more people or hit our numbers. The really the goal of putting in place this recruiting process and hiring someone as senior as Medina is to actually go look outside of the talent that we already know, uh, go to other industries, make sure that we're paying attention, that we have a diverse recruiting process and, and inclusive recruiting process and that we're putting the effort there. So that's just one of the things. Obviously, you then have to put in place all the things that su support inclusion in your company once the people get there. But it really starts with, you know, going to get the, the talent with different yeah. perspectives. You have to, you mentioned going outside of the industry. That's almost where we sort of in the short term, that's the, that's what we have to do, isn't it? Uh, I was, um, I did a, a talk with Sumo in the UK recently and they've, they've, they've put out an entire academy program where they get people from who don't know, you know, might know how, might know what programming is or know a little bit about it, but I've actually gone into um, people in history degrees and all this kind of stuff to, to teach them and bring them through that kind of thing. Obviously they're a really big studio, so they can do stuff like that, but it's, um, it's, uh, it's, that's, yeah, that's brilliant. That's, um, <clears throat> I'm glad to hear it. But I mean, how do you go about sort of establishing these values and this culture, I guess, when you can't get together <laughs> like during a pandemic, that must be, <laughs> that must be really difficult. How, how have you managed? To, how are you trying to do that? Assuming you've managed it. So we've been putting a lot of effort into it. It does require more effort. I mean, luckily, as I said, many of us already know and we have the established relationships. But um, no matter what, there are definitely, you know, we want to create that new culture together. And we want mm. to, you know, how do we put that in place when we're mostly talking through screens? So we've done a ton of things. You know, at first, uh, we didn't we didn't have a studio at first, so we we got uh, these vans. We rented these vans, and on the first day when we welcomed everyone, we drove around to everyone's house and we dropped off the equipment because, of course, we had to get people their new equipment yeah. for the startup. But we did it, you know, with a care package, and we did it in person, wearing our masks. But we drove around door to door, and it was kind of a more fun way to actually welcome. Um, new people to a company because you get to, you know, maybe see their kids in the background and, you know, meet their partner or whatever and, and you know, like chat a bit and it's sort of like personal service of going to their door yeah. and delivering the things. Uh, so we called that the, we called that the wonder truck delivery. Um, we, um, we also, you know, ha get together in parks. So we've been doing a lot of, actually, when we've got new equipment, the, uh, we've, gotten together in the park and distributed, you know, the new keyboards that we got just came in. Let's all meet in the park and have an excuse to see each other face to face. Um, and then, you know, all kinds of things. We give everyone a buddy. We, you know, I mean, we've put together so many different programs of, we also have a big focus on sort of onboarding where we um, have different presentations where we actually go through our values and the process we went through and the why behind it and what it means and, uh, you know, our code of conduct, which is, which is not super formal. It's more meant to just really share from, a, you know, our thought process and, and how that translates into how we want to behave at work. So just, you know, 
we're, we're trying to, to do that. And then, of course, you're, nev you're never going to get everything right. And I think one other thing is to talk about that um, and say these values are important to us. They're probably the most important thing, um, you know, creating the culture and the values. And we're, we're, going, we're not always going to behave in a way that's consistent. And we want you to bring it up when you see like, hey, we're doing this, but it doesn't seem like it supports this value. And we'll, you know, and then listening and adjusting. And I think it's, you know, you have to continue to work on it and you have to continue to, to like be open to uh, adjusting the way you're behaving um, when you get the feedback. So I think all kinds of things. But yeah, you have to work hard at it, basically. So you you mostly hiring in, in sort of the, uh, I guess, Montreal area or is cause, because COVID does, I guess, it has presented the interesting opportunity where a lot of studios are sort of going, well, actually, now we can recruit from further afield enough. That makes it challenge for this culture objective, I guess. But is that so is it mostly you're mostly hiring in the area? Yeah, with a few exceptions, we have made a few exceptions, but um, we still have a dream of going back to a studio <laughs> and, yeah. and being there in person. I do think for the creative process, uh, you know, my best days are days when I get to walk around and, you know, see what people are working on and chat and like sit at the desk and play at the thing that's just being prototyped or whatever, or just having a casual conversation in the cafe. So, and um, yeah, we have a lot of, you know, we talked to the team about it and got their input. Would you like to stay remote? How do you feel about it? And everyone said that they really wanted to be in the office altogether a certain amount of days. That's really what the team says they want. So we're all looking forward to that. And of course, um, so we're trying to keep that consistent um, in terms of, you know, yes, we will make a few exceptions if people really need to move. Or there's a couple of people, for example, Corey May, who's our world director, who was the original writer on the first Assassin's Creed and then the writer for the brand and has an amazing, you know, he lives in California and he had to be part of the core team because he is part of the core team. So we, you know, we had to make an exception. So Corey's on video, but he's cut, he's traveling and he'll be here for some of the key brainstorms. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll make, a, we're making a few exceptions, but we're trying to keep the team mostly in Montreal. Yeah, okay. Um, so how have sort of the things you were doing at Google, how has, has that helped? Is that, is it that you sort of dropped all that and have moved on or, or has it helped inform this new team and what you're doing? Um, the things we were doing at Stadia Google. or? Yeah, Stadia. Yeah, Google. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, actually, there were a lot of really good learnings. I mean, first of all, the people at Google are brilliant. So that was a great experience to get to meet so many brilliant people. But uh, the tech was really amazing. I mean, you have to admit, you know, what Stadia has managed to pull off in terms of streaming tech mm -hmm. is cutting edge. And so getting to, you know, work under the hood at that cutting edge of, of tech is really interesting. It's let us actually um, build a studio in the cloud. So right now, all of our processes, everything, we don't have build machines or the, it's all in the cloud, which is cool because we're starting up a studio. Everyone got these Alienware powerful laptops that we can game on. We can also program on or, you know, develop on and we, they're, you know, we can bring them in the park when we're meeting or to another place as a brainstorm. But and then all of the tools and everything are running in the cloud. So a lot of that, you know, thought process of how to set up everything um, on the cloud has been inspired by the way we were working at Google. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, I think with very ambitious games and when you're thinking about the PS5 and what it can do and you're thinking about trying to achieve this kind of next level um, quality in a game visually and you have an art director like Rafael Acosta and you have, have these ambitions, you know, you have to think, what does it mean to support kind of, you know, maybe the first terabyte game or the, you know, what does it mean to support this kind of, this kind of level of data? And so all of those things that um, we learned to make stream, stream games of this generation possible are interesting to reach the next level of quality. So yeah, we, we do have quite a few um, things that we've learned that we're applying to the way we're approaching our tech stack. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing with um, uh, cloud. We, we, yes, game streaming and the prospect of that is exciting when, when the world is ready for it, when gamers are ready for it, whatever. But what we, what we can do now in terms of game development, but also what it can do to the games that we're making as well as how we're making them is that's immediate. We, that, that's, 
that's that's what we can that's already making a difference and it's yeah. yeah i mean already we have you know basically we give someone their laptop and within you know seconds they press on some buttons you know some uh, tools that we set up in the tray and it loads based on their profile everything they need it's all working on the cloud like they said you know even in other companies where there are armies of people doing the setup um that it's working better so yeah i mean thanks in part to our cto and the great you know tech people that we have working on that stuff but it's definitely inspired by um the way we were working at google well you mentioned this earlier you've immediately partnered with with playstation herman and, and, that, and that whole team um, but I'm sure you had your pick of backers. So why why Sony? What was it that made you go right? That, those are the that's has the partner. Well, there are many reasons. Yeah. Um, I think you know Sony really does have the best reputation for supporting the creative process and supporting dev teams. I you know I've done a lot of talking to different developers about their experience. You know, working with different. Um, different publishers and Sony does stand out as being um, a company that really understands the creative process and, and developing games and supports the dev teams and gives them the autonomy they need. So, so that was a big attractor. Also just um, we're all sort of, you know, big fans since we're kids of Sony. So there's something really cool about getting to work on a, you know, first party PlayStation game that was really appealing to us um like sort of you know for a lot of people a dream of something they wanted to do so so it was you know i guess just we're, we're all super super excited about the opportunity yeah well yeah. you mentioned the team being excited about working with playstation you mentioned the team you mentioned a few names already so but can you tell us tell us about the team who are the key players and you said 53 of you did you say yeah yeah so, so tell us about them yeah, so we have, well, we have a bunch of people who are on the original Assassin's Creed with me. So that's really cool. Oh, um, you know, to, we started in 2004 working together. And there's these people who now, you know, we were all young. I was 29 at the time, um, you know, and now we all have kids and it's, you know, gray hair and uh, many years later. But we still love working together. And it's just so cool to, you know, Corey was there, Raphael was there, Mathieu Leduc. Uh, who's our creative director, was there on that game. Uh, Sapin, that's not his, his name is Pierre-Francois Sapinski, Duff, you know, the list goes on and on, but we have a lot of people from that original game. And there were, there, there really was a magical feeling uh, when we were working on the first one. And, and I feel like we have that again. Um, and then we also have, you know, a, a bunch of those people and other people who are on Rainbow Six Siege, um, who are also, I'd say, like, that's a, that's a large portion of our team as well. And some people who are with me on, you know, who went from AC, creating AC to creating the first watchdogs. So a big part of that team as well. And then also some people who are at EA and also at Google and so worked on Star Wars and, and you know, we're at, at, at Ubisoft Toronto. Actually, uh, Leon, the CTO, was you know, helped me, I think, now build the three different studios. <laughs> so, um, so... Yeah, I, I mean, just a team of, um, you know, I guess people who really enjoy working together and, and have been, you know, working on and, and are also passionate about new IP. That's the other thing I'd say we have in common. I mean, I think even though Rainbow Six Siege wasn't necessarily a new IP, it was very different for the brand and yeah. the people who were attracted to being on Assassins and then, you know, went to Watch Dogs and went to Rainbow Six and, and were willing to take the leap with me to other studios or people who kind of crave like pushing the boundaries and doing new stuff as well. Yeah, well, uh, it's, you made, you <laughs> set up three studios. Are you, are you done with setting up studios now? Is this... <laughs> Well, I'm happy that we're doing it for ourselves now. But yes, this is, this is, this is, uh, I think that's also the beauty of setting up the studio independently is like, you can really feel like you're taking all the learnings, you know, that we've had setting up new studios mm. and now applying it with a fresh, you know, blank page where you yeah. can really go, okay, this, this worked well, this, you know, not so well. And this is how we're going to do things, uh, better this yeah. time. Well, how are you looking to grow? So you've got 53, 50, I uh, can't say, my, put my teeth in. Um, you've got 53 uh, employees now. So how are you looking to grow? How big are you hoping to get? Do you have a number? Is it, does it work that way? 
So we do have an Im ambitious new IP uh, mm -hmm. that's at the AAA level. So mm -hmm. obviously we're going to have a team that's um, you know, going to be relatively large so that we can actually deliver on that vision. Um, and, you know, I think just the pool of people that we've worked with through all of these different games and all of these different studios is quite large, but really our goal isn't just to recruit the people or, or bring together, as I said, that team, you know, and all the people we know. It's really, you know, how do we get the talent you know, the next generation of talent. How do we, in, how do we bring people from, with different perspectives from different industries in? How do we, you know, get, for me personally, what really excites me is, you know, right now we're in the full hands-on startup phase, but once we get through this initial phase and we can start, you know, really investing in new grads, and, um, you know, I just feel like that passion of just out of school and also the perspective of the different, kinds of games that that people who grew up you know mm. playing their whole life and like what they're playing and and what they're excited about i just feel like that's an energy i'm really looking forward to a being back in the studio and then b getting that you know new talent in and and uh having that kind of inspire i think all of us now old timers <laughs> <laughs> it's upsetting to think of old times. um the um so are you, do you, are you in a, are you in the studio now or is it um uh, is it? I don't. I don't know the situation. It is in uh, Montreal, actually. Is there are people? Some people working in the studio. Is it all still remote? Uh, yeah, in Montreal, um, you you can go in the studio, and we have right now a co work space. We're waiting to get. We're we're looking at a sublease now, and oh, and see. we should have our official space soon. But um, for now, we have a co work, and it's pretty good actually. It's surprisingly many. You know, we have sort of this reservation system going, kind of uh, where you can book your desk if you're going to go in. And there are quite a few days where it's fully booked because we have mm. a team that likes going in and being in person. Yeah, I've yeah. sort of enjoyed. Um... The games industry in the UK has sort of opened up in the last two or three weeks. People are going, attending things and visiting studios. And, and I've, I've, I, I'm a kind of a remote team anyway. We do have an office it's quite far from where we all live. But it's, um, uh, it's, I've enjoyed, I've enjoyed going back to the games industry and, and actually meeting people. It's been, it's been really nice. So yeah, I can understand the uh, excitement about sort of getting your own space. Yeah. Mm. Um, I'll ask one final question because I'm conscious of the time. Because, um, and this is a really general one, a very broad one. It's um, that the games industry is is well, it's gone through a massive change during COVID, but there's always massive change. We've got new technologies, got these new business models and subscriptions and things like that. We've got AAA games are just becoming bigger and more expansive. I know you know that better than than most. Um, out of all the things going on, what is what is sort of exciting you the most about the future of this business? So there are three things that are really exciting me that are also, you know, kind of pillars for the way we're thinking about things. First is um, games as a social platform. Um, I think the pandemic more than anything has proven that games is the social game, gameplay is the social glue that binds communities. I mean, we really see, and especially for the younger generation, I mean, this is what you do and, and how you make friends and the way you hang out and spend time. And so that's something we really want to build on and design for and think of creating an even more kind of positive, how do you, how do you design for a positive social game platform? Um, and so that's something we're excited about and focusing on quite a bit. Um, the, the second thing is thinking about the remix generation. That's what we call it is, you know, um, it started a little while ago, but there's kind of this age of self-expression where, okay, we're designing our Nike ID shoes and, you know, we're, we're reading what our friends blog mm -hmm. says instead of what the professional journalists are writing, or, you know, it's all about what I did or what, what, you know, my, my personal stamp is on the thing. Um, and I think that's continued to go even further and further as we see with TikTok. And, you know, it's, it's, it's even more than just, you know, my thing, but it's remixing other people's stuff becomes a way to express yourself in kind of a lower, lighter weight way. Um, and so that's another thing at the heart of the way we're thinking about creating this new IP. It's, it's beyond UGC. It's, it's, you know, how do we take things to the next level, that, that kind of self-expression um, and remix concept. And then 
The third thing, which has been, you know, really inspiring to us as a team for a long time, which is creating new IP. And I think, um, you know, creating real IP that is, is a world that, that can last for generations and something that becomes meaningful to people on a deeper, deeper level. And the, I wrote a, a little op-ed for um, A16Z's uh, future blog on this, but, but for me personally and, and also for the co-founders and the team, it's a question of how do we create an IP that has all of that appeal and that depth but is actually designed to be owned by the fans from the start. Mm -hmm. So when we created Assassin's Creed, you know, we were really thinking, how do we design an IP that can be owned by professional creative teams in the future? So we had this idea of like, you know, if we create a framework of, you know, anything that takes place in a historical moment in history and has the assassins behind it, uh, you know, will be consistent with the brand. So teams can own that and continue to evolve it. Um, what we're thinking now is how do we create an IP where it's not just professional teams, but can really is designed to be owned by the fans and live on uh, because it can evolve through that. So, so um, anyways, th <laughs> those no. are those are kind of the three main things that are ex that's exciting us. Yeah, it's really fascinating. I ask this question from time to time, and I expect someone to say cloud or subscriptions. But the answers are always more interesting and more insightful <laughs> than uh, than just a piece of technology or a business model or, or something. So. <laughs> Well, great that's a fantastic answer um oh, i look forward you. to seeing i look forward to seeing what that what that's gonna what that's gonna come out with at the end i guess once uh uh once once everything's ready well i mean i'm quite, i'm really aware of the time but thank you so much for your time thank today, Jay. thank you so much it's been yeah. great chatting with you and yeah. so happy to finally meet you and have a chance to discuss yeah well good luck with the studio and i really can't wait to see what what you've been working on or what you will be working on um and for those who are watching at home, that's it for this session. We will be back imminently with a talk all about the lasting impact of COVID on video game sales, um, uh, featuring digital and physical game data. So do join us for that one. But uh, thank you all for watching. And thank you to Jade again. Thank you. Thank you.